Today we will continue exploring the relationship between NLP and IR. In particular, we will move to a very powerful technique called uh, latent semantic indexing, which is uh, a bridge between NLP and IR. So, today's topic is NLP and IR, how NLP has used IR toward latent semantic indexing and uh, this discussion will be facilitated by uh, a discourse on principal component analysis. All right. So, we are uh, discussing the relationship between NLP and IR. In particular, uh, we would like to see how natural language processing has used IR. We were uh, discussing this in the last class also and we mentioned that web is looked upon as a huge repository of evidence for language uh, phenomena. So, the point being made here is that uh, natural language is a very dynamic evolving entity and uh, uh, since language always evolves and language has many different forms across cultures, across countries, across times, uh, evidences of language usage have to be found in various repositories and uh, web happens to be a very important uh, repository for language usage. This is where in the web itself we find language in use in varied forms and uh, all these language phenomena need to be uh, processed by a machine. We have to design techniques, algorithms for processing these phenomena. What we find is that uh, different languages just to take a particular case, different languages have different dialects in uh, different parts of a country or even a state. If we take the case of English, English has many different forms in India, in UK, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Australia and so on and so forth. And natural language processing techniques have to be devised for all this. Now, these techniques require uh, training through machine learning algorithms. Evidences have to be shown to these training algorithms and they can be found from uh, the web. So, that is the main idea behind this first point. Web is looked upon as a huge repository of evidence for language phenomena. Now, what we find is that there are many measures which are used for co-occurrence, co-location, malapropism, evaluation of scene sets which are typical natural language processing problems and uh, one can make use of PMI, point wise mutual information measure for these NLP phenomena. We will see what this measure is and how it looks. Another important uh, use of inf IR ideas has been the application of page rank algorithm for words and disambiguation. This we will uh, discuss briefly and uh, a very important current topic is uh, getting dictionary from comparable corpora which abound in the web. So, we see papers even this year which tries to get the dictionary from comparable corpora and uh, comparable corpora abounds in the web for example, from newspaper domain. Now, getting the dictionary uh, which is probabilistic a statistical dictionary it is a very important task in natural language processing. It is used for many things and the most important amongst those is statistical machine translation. So, getting the uh, statistical dictionary from aligned corpora is a very important task, but that needs aligned corpora. Aligned corpora is by itself a very tedious task. It is manpower intensive, money intensive, time intensive. On the other hand, one can easily find corpora which discuss the same topic, but are from different uh, uh, sources in different languages. For example, a, an article on uh, India's foreign policy, India's recent foreign policy can appear in uh, Times of India which is a English daily and can also appear in Navabharat Times which is a Hindi daily and uh, they are likely to discuss uh, the same topic. but in a different uh, languages, also the sentences need not be exactly parallel to each other. 
So, in such cases also it should be possible to uh, extract the dictionary from this uh, corpora. It has not taken any human labor to generate the comparable corpora. It is the day to day activity of some two newspapers, but it is possible to generate a dictionary from this. So, getting dictionary from comparable corpora is a very life problem and uh, this is where we see IR uh, providing resources to natural language processing. And how has IR used natural language processing? Query disambiguation surely has been a very important problem in IR and it is thought that words and disambiguation is necessary here, but uh, does it really make a difference? Uh, we can discuss this later uh, in some other uh, discussion. The, the query disambiguation must have different techniques than in NLP because of the very small context. The query size is typically three words and uh, here uh, one can see the use of what is called pseudo relevance feedback which helps disambiguate and expand the query. IR has also used statistical stemming in place of morphology, but there are languages whose uh, information retrieval needs elaborate morphological analysis because the words are formed in a complex way. Then in information retrieval it is important to capture term relationships, so there are random walk algorithms, semantic association based algorithms. All right. So, we now take a look at uh, Watson's disambiguation using random walk algorithm or page rank. So, here is a situation where there are four words bell, ring, church and Sunday. So, we have removed from this sentence, this was a sentence. So, maybe the sentence is all bells ring in the church on a Sunday. So, words like all the a etcetera have been removed because they are not ambiguous words, but uh, what remains are verbs, nouns, adjectives and adverbs and they need to be disambiguated. Now, let us look at these four words and their senses. Church has three senses, one of the groups of Christians who have their own beliefs and forms of worship. Second meaning is a place for public, especially Christian worship, three is a service conducted in a church. Similarly, bell has three senses, a hollow device made of a metal that makes a ringing sound when struck, a push button at an outer door that gives a ringing or buzzing signal when pushed or the sound of a bell. Ring again means uh, make a ringing sound, ring or echo with sound, make bells ring often for the purposes of musical edification. Sunday is not ambiguous, uh, this is uh, this has the meaning first day of the week observed as a day of rest and worship by most Christians. All right. So, we have these four words and on top of each word we erect the senses. So, bell has four cent senses S1, S2 and S3, uh, ring also has uh, three senses, charge has three senses and Sunday has a single sense. So, after these uh, senses are erected, then we create edges between the senses going from one word to the next and uh, these edges are embellished with weights which uses definition based semantic similarity. This is the LESC method and then we apply a graph based ranking algorithm to find the score of each vertex that is for each word sense and we select the vertex or the sense which has the highest score. So, when the algorithm stops uh, S 1 on bell which is a hollow device made of metal that makes a ringing sound when struck this is the sense which becomes the winner ring S 3 is the winner S 3 is make bells ring often for the purposes of musical edification and for charge S 2 is the winner which is a place for public especially Christian worship and for Sunday which has a single sense this is the winner. So, after the running of the page rank algorithm which is uh, based on importance of a particular node and the importance it transfers by its linkages to other nodes which uh, is a very information retrieval ish idea where uh, nodes are pages and uh, edges are links to other pages. 
has been borrowed into Watson disambiguation. This is Mihalcia et al's work in 2004. And these two formulas show how nodes transfer their importance to other nodes. Uh, so, this is uh, the mathematical expression which says that the importance of uh, node uh, V i which is uh, connected to other nodes V j where j is in the link of V i is equal to importance of V j divided by the outgoing links of V j. So, and we take sum of uh, all these V j's which are linked to V i and then we obtain the importance of V i. Similarly, a weighted sum of the importance is used to get the weighted importance of the node V i. All right. So, these uh, we need not go into a lot of details. Uh, what I would like to stress is that this idea of importance going from one node to another over the links is a very IR ish idea. Now, we discuss a very interesting problem which is in the heartland of uh, natural language processing. So, this there is a phenomenon called malapropism and uh, there was work in trying to show how this problem could be solved. So, malapropism is real word error in a text consisting of unintended replacement of one content word by another existing content word similar in sound, but semantically incompatible with the context. All right. So, in malapropism one replaces a word by another valid word of the language, but the new word is completely a misfit semantically in the context. Malapropism has been immortalized by Mrs. Malaprop in Sheridan's The Rival. This is a very famous novel, but uh, more famous than novel is this character in the novel Mrs. Malaprop because of her odd speech, because of her usage of words which uh, sound similar to an accurate word in that context, but the word she uses is completely a misfit. So, here is an example why murder is the matter, slaughter is the matter, killing is the matter, but he can tell you the perpendiculars. So, the word perpendicular here is a complete misfit. what uh, Mal Mrs. Malaprop meant was, uh, but he can tell you the particulars. So, she meant particulars, instead she used perpendiculars, which is completely a misfit. The second example is, he is the very pineapple of politeness. Uh, the idiomatic expression in English uh, for this uh, politeness which is uh, very appropriate and which is in right amount. Uh, the actual sentence would be he is the very pinnacle of politeness. Instead of pinnacle she has used the word pineapple which is a fruit. So, these two examples show what malapropism is. It is essentially substituting a valid word by a not so accurate uh, word, which is semantically odd. Now, the distinguishing features of malapropism, which is uh, reproduced from Wikipedia is that the word or phrase that is used means something different from the word the speaker or writer intended to use. The word or phrase that is used sounds similar to the word that was apparently meant or intended using obtuse, wide or dull instead of acute, narrow or sharp is not a malapropism. Using obtuse, stupid or slow witted when one means abstruse, esoteric or difficult to understand would be. So, the point here is that uh, the word or the phrase must sound similar and it should be a completely misfit in the context. The word or phrase that is used has a recognized meaning in the speaker's or writer's language, the resulting utterance is a nonsense. So, uh, this particular problem was uh, tackled uh, using uh, pointwise mutual information and uh, here uh, some of the experiment results are shown which we will come to little later, but malapropism should be differentiated from a few related errors. One is spelling error. They travel around the worked here 
the word actually is world. The letter K came here because L and K are adjacent on the keyboard and the person has typed K instead of L. Now, spelling error is a solved problem. There are many systems which detect spelling error and make very sensible suggestions. There is another phenomenon which is related to malapropism that is called Eckhorn. This is idiosyncratic substitution, but plausible. For example, one uses the word expatriate instead of expatriate and uh, the word means approximately same as expatriate, but is not exactly that. On the spot of the moment instead of on the spar of the moment, on the spar of the moment is a fixed expression, on the spot of the moment is not idiomatic, but still there is not much violation of the meaning. Spoonerism is an interesting phenomenon where there is error in speech or deliberate play on words in which corresponding consonants, vowels or morphemes are switched. So, for example, the expression here a very famous biblical expression a loving shepherd is expressed as the Lord is a shoving leopard. The actual sentence should be the Lord is a loving shepherd. A blushing crow instead of a crashing blow you have hissed all my mystery classes instead of you have missed all my history classes. Here also one does not see much improvement in the area. Uh, the next point is pun. Pun here are two examples is life worth living that depends a lot on the liver. There is pun on liver, liver can mean a body part or a person who is living and both the meanings are plausible. We are not getting anywhere in geometry class, it feels like we are going in circles, here also there is pun on circles. So, the solution which was proposed for uh, doing malapropism detection was through the Google search and the mutual information. Here is the mutual information formula. This quantity n v w is the number of web pages which contains v and w together. This n max is a normalizing factor which is the number of times uh, or the number of pages containing the most frequent word in the language. Now, this uh, logarithm of n v w divided by n m n m x should be gr greater than individual logarithm of n v n divided by n max plus logarithm of n w divided by n max. So, what it means is that the proportion of pages containing uh, v and w together should be greater than the sum of the number of pages containing v and those pages containing w individually. So, this and also logarithm of course. So, this formula indicates that if v and w is a strong collocation, then their occurring together is much more than their uh, accidental individual occurring together in a page. Okay. So, this is the point wise mutual information formula. So, the formula detects very strong collocations between two words v and w. Now, n max is found in the following way. Uh, we find the number of pages where the word the appears. So, the number of pages containing the word the that should give me n max that uh, maximum number of pages containing the most frequent word in the language. So, what is the overall idea? The overall idea is that v and w are uh, are checked for their being collocated. Now, if a word is a malapropism word in a sentence, then it will not have strong collocation, collocation with any of the words in the language. For example, I travel around the world, travel and world have strong collocation, but travel and word will not have strong collocation. So, if we uh, try to see if travel and word are uh, collocated, we launch a search with travel and word together and identify the number of pages where travel and word occur together. We also launch another search with travel and word occurring together 
and there we will find a very large number of pages because there is a strong collocation. So, here IR or the web is helping us to detect collocation and thereby solve the problem of malapropism. So, here are some uh, experimental results which we had shown before. Travel around the world, the correct version which is world travel around the world has 55,000 web pages showing this pattern, but travel around the world this has only 20 pages. Swim to spoon has 23 correct version and 0 malapropism version. Take for granite instead of take for granted. So, take for granted will have has 340,000 web pages and uh, take for granite has only 15 pages. Vowels are pronounced instead of vowels are pronounced the correct version is 767 pages and so on. So, this number shows that words which are strong collocations have very strong web evidence of uh, being together in a page and malapropism words when tested for their collocation with other words in the sentence show very little evidence on the web. So, based on that we can identify if a word is a malapropism word or not. The purpose of this discussion was to show that uh, natural language processing can make use of the resources of the web to solve uh, its intricate and interesting problems. Now, what is the use of malapropism detection? Uh, malapropism detection uh, comes in the spectrum of correcting desktop uh, publishing. So, we write here a few points. If I look upon uh, this spectrum of uh, wrong text correction, then we find that at one end of the spectrum is spelling error and the other end of the spectrum is semantic error. For example, malapropism. Okay. So, spelling error will detect a wrongly spelt word. So, travel around the word instead of traveling around the word. And here we have travel around the word instead of world here also instead of word. Okay. Now, here word has been misspelt as worked L substituted by K. This is an easy error to detect, but world uh, replaced with word where L has been dropped. There is a deletion error and this was a substitution error. This is a far more difficult problem to detect because all the words are correct words of the language, but travel around the word does not make any sense. So, that has to be detected through sophisticated techniques for example, malapropism detection. Okay. So, this is the motivation behind tackling this error. All right. So, we have uh, seen a, an example of a hardcore natural language processing problem, a problem directly from the heartland of natural language processing which has been solved by making use of the information retrieval resource. Okay. So, we move ahead and uh, then we bring up a very important topic uh, namely latent uh, semantic indexing and for uh, this technique we need to understand a another technique called principal component analysis PCA that is what we will do now. Now, what is the importance of latent semantic indexing LSI as it is called? LSI is very important because it uh, shows an association between words which are semantically related through the evidence of documents which contain those words. Okay. So, we saw uh, collocation detection through uh, the evidences of the web, but uh, that became possible when search engine technology matured and the web contained lot of corpora and it was possible to uh, extract or bring pages from the web at a fast speed. But 
what we find is that when before even before IR became very mature very efficient, there was a need for detecting wards which are uh, semantically related based on the evidence of corpora where they occur. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, the purpose and the main goal here is to capture semantic association between words and this is used for uh, improving the recall in information retrieval. That means, words which are semantically related will also be used for detecting for uh, fetching pages from the corpora. So, now uh, we will write a few points again in IR uh, a very important challenge or rather two important challenges are one synonymy and uh, B polysemy. So, not detecting synonymy, not detecting synonymy leads to reduced recall. Okay. So, that means, a query has been launched and uh, the query words are used to fetch the document, but it is possible that the same query words have synonyms and just because words are being matched, the actual web page uh, containing synonymous words will not be brought. So, this brings down the recall of search. On the other hand, uh, not tackling polysemy can lead to reduced precision. So, this means that pages containing the word not in the same sense as the query are also retrieved. So, this brings down the performance of the search engine by reducing precision, but the previous problem where if synonymy is not detected then uh, that brings down the recall of the system. So, both situations are undesirable and at least for uh, synonymy one can make use of this powerful technique of latent semantic indexing and improve the recall of retrieval. Okay. So, we proceed uh, uh, from a basic uh, discussion which is on principal component analysis. Here is an example, there is a famous data which is used by machine learning researchers. This data is called the iris data. So, there are 150 such rows as is shown here. The first column is the ID of the data item, the second column is an attribute which is the petal length, third column is an attribute which is the petal width, fourth column is an attribute called sepal length followed by an attribute called sepal width. And based on these four parameters namely petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width, we identify the flowers as one of the three classes Iris Setsosa, Iris Versicolor uh, and the third class is Iris Virginica, Iris Setsosa, Iris Versicolor and Iris Virginica. So, here uh, this uh, table shows three such classes and their corresponding attributes. For example, if the petal length is 5.1 units, petal width is 3.5 units, sepal length is 1.4 units and sepal width is 0 0.2 units, then the classification of the flower is into the iris set soza class. So, abstractly speaking here is a problem where there are three classes and there are four attributes and our goal is to uh, create a learning system which when given the petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width will produce the correct classification of the flower. All right. So, we uh, discuss the learning situation once again, uh, the training happens on 80 percent of the data. For There are 50 uh, examples each from the three classes making it up as 150 examples for the three classes all together. Out of these 50, we take up 40 for training and leave 10 for testing. 
So, 40 from each class, uh, so totally there are 120 class examples for training. Testing is on the remaining 30 examples. Okay. So, after training the machine will be given uh, the four attributes of any of these 30 examples and it is supposed to classify the example correctly. Now, the question we ask is do we have to consider all the four attributes for classification? Do we have to have four neurons in the input layer? This is with respect to a neural network which is used for the classification machine and less neurons in the input layer may reduce the overall size of the network and thereby reduce training time. It will also likely increase the generalization performance which is the Occam razor hypothesis, a simpler hypothesis that is the neural net for example, in this case generalizes better. So, the main point uh, behind uh, this uh, slide is that we make a portion of given data as training data and the rest of the data is used for testing, testing the efficacy of the learned system. And on the way we ask if all the attributes which are used for deciding the class are needed. Okay. So, this is an important point because if all attributes are not needed then we have a much more compact machine learning system. So, we generalize the discussion and go into what is called the processing of multivariate data. Here we have these p attributes and each of uh, the values of the attributes are given for each example. So, the first row is for the first example where the attribute x 1 has the value x 1 1, x 2 has the value x 1 2, x 3 has the value x 1 3, x 4 has x 1 4. Similarly, the p th attribute has the value x 1 p. So, proceeding this way the last example has the values x n 1, x n 2, x n 3 up to x n p for the attributes x 1 to x p. Okay. So, this is the table which is given along with its uh, classification. There should be a y column which shows the classification and we discuss how to process this multivariate data. So, we make use of some preliminary notions. First is the sample mean vector which is expressed as mu 1, mu 2 up to mu p for the p attributes and uh, where mu i for the ith attribute is sigma j equal to 1 to n x i j divided by n. So, what it means is that if we look at the multivariate data once again for example, the sample mean is a vector of mean values of the attributes and their values. So, mu 3 for example, will be obtained by summing up all these values and dividing it by n. So, for an attribute what the values are this and the mean of those values. Similarly, the variance for the ith variable is the standard formula sigma i square is equal to j equal to 1 to n x i j minus mu i whole square divided by n minus 1. Okay. So, this shows the deviation from the mean of a value and sample covariance also can be found which is C a b equal to x a j minus mu a into x b j minus mu b divided by n minus 1. So, do take this product of x a j minus mu a and x b j minus mu b j varying from 1 to n and divided by n minus 1 and we have the sample uh, covariance matrix. This measures the correlations in the data. In fact, the correlation coefficient r a b equal to c a b divided by sigma a into sigma b. Now, the first thing which is done is that for each variable value x i j we normalize it. So, we get from x i j y i j which is nothing but x i j minus mu y divided by sigma uh, i square sigma j sigma i square yes. So, uh, sigma i square is the variance of the ith attribute and x i j minus mu i is the departure from the attribute mean. Similarly, the correlation matrix uh, is written here which is 1 r 1 2 r 1 3 up to r 1 p. So, each r i j is the correlation coefficient as defined in the previous uh, slide 
by means of C A B and sigma A and sigma B. So, this is the correlation matrix who all whose diagonal elements are 1 and other values are correlation coefficients. Now, we make a short digression and discuss the importance of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in this whole topic. So, given a matrix A, we can find out the eigenvalues of the matrix by means of this fundamental equation A x equal to lambda x. And this uh, equation can be expanded to write these P equations x a 1 1 x 1 plus a 1 2 x 2 plus a 1 3 x 3 up to a 1 p x p equal to lambda x 1. Similarly, a 2 1 x 1 up to a 2 p x p equal to lambda x 2 and so on and finally, we have a p 1 x 1 a p 2 x 2 up to a p p x p equal to lambda x p. Here, these lambdas are eigenvalues and the solution x 1 x 2 x 3 up to x p for each lambda is the eigen vector. So, let us take an example. Suppose, uh, the matrix is minus 9, 4, 7, 6. Okay. So, the first row elements are minus 9 and 4 and second row elements are 7 and minus 6. So, we uh, have to solve determinant a minus lambda i equal to 0 and get the value of lambda. So, a minus lambda i, where i is the identity matrix, which is nothing but 1 0 0 1, lambda i is the matrix lambda 0 0 lambda. So, a minus uh, lambda i will uh, give us uh, a minus lambda i will uh, give us this characteristic equation minus 9 minus lambda into minus 6 minus lambda e minus 28 equal to 0. Solving this equation, we find that the lambda values are minus 13 and minus 2. So, the from these two uh, eigenvalues, we get these two eigenvectors minus 1, minus 1 and 4 and 7. So, for eigenvalue of minus 13, the eigenvector is minus 1, 1 and for the eigenvalue of minus 2, the eigenvector is 4, 7. Okay. So, after this digression, we now discuss how we find the principal components for the multivariate data. Now, we see that from the multivariate data, we have got this, this rank correlation matrix, which is 1 r 1 2 r 1 3 up to r 1 p, each r i j is a correlation coefficient between the i th attribute and the j th attribute. So, for this uh, multivariate data from this uh, rank correlation matrix, we find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of R. So, we uh, take here an example. There are 49 birds, 21 of which survived in a storm and 28 died. And 5 body characteristics are given. First uh, attribute is body length. Second attribute is as a biological term called LR extent. X 3 is beak and head length. X 4 is humerus length and X 5 is Kill length. So, depending on these 5 attributes, we are supposed to decide if a bird will survive in a storm or not. So, could we have predicted the fate from the body characteristics? So, from uh, the multivariate data from these 5 attributes for 49 data items, we can make use of the rank, we can produce the rank correlation coefficient matrix. And having found the R matrix, we can get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, what we show here is for the first component, the eigenvalue is 3.612, first eigenvector V 1. Uh, is 0 0.452 for the second eigenvector. This is 0 0.462, V 3 is 0 0.451, V 4 is 0 0.471 and V 5 is 0 0.398 for all the 5 components. Now, we ask which principal components are important. So, 
the total variance in the data can be measured as the sum of the diagonals of the rank correlation coefficient matrix which comes out to be 5. So, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 plus lambda 4 plus lambda 5 this is equal to sum of diagonals of r which is equal to 5. Now, the first eigenvalue is 3.616 which is uh, 72 percent of the total variance 5 and second eigenvalue uh, corresponds to 10.6 percent of the total variance, third corresponds to 7.7 percent, fourth corresponds to 6.0 percent and fifth corresponds to 3.3 percent. So, first principal component is, is the most important and sufficient for studying the classification because this uh, covers 72 percent of the total variance. The principal components can be formed by making use of the 5 uh, components and the corresponding Eigen values. So, we can introduce 2 variables z 1 and z 2, z 1 is uh, found using this formula 0 0.451 x 1 plus 0 0.462 x 2, 0 0.451 x 3, 0 0.471 x 4 and 0 0.398 x 5. Similarly, z 2 can be found out. So, for all the 49 words we can find out the first 2 principal components and this becomes a new data and we can uh, make a classifier by making use of these uh, two components. Okay. So, for the first part x 1 is 156, x 2 is 245, x 3 is 31.6, x 4 is 18.5, x 5 is 20.5. So, these are the various values for beak length, body length, LR parameter and so on. And so, after standardizing which is uh, essentially seeing the devi deviation from the attribute mean and dividing by the sigma square of the attribute, we get y 1, y 2, y 3, y 4 and y 5 as these values minus 0 0.54, 0 0.73, 0 0.17, 0 0.05 and minus 0 0.33. So, principal component 1 for the first part is z 1 equal to 0 0.45 into minus 0 0.54 plus 0 0.46 into 0 0.725 plus 0 0.45 into 0 0.17, 0 0.47 into 0 0.05, 0 0.39 into minus 0 0.33. Similarly, we can find the value of z 2 as 0 0.602. So, now the classification data uh, gets a reduced form. Instead of this uh, 49 rows with uh, 5 attributes, instead of a 5 by 49 column, we have uh, we have a 2 by 49 column. So, these 5 attributes have been now reduced to 2 attributes. Okay. So, data size has reduced. The effects of these uh, 5 attributes have been distilled into 2 attributes which are z 1 and z 2 through the technique of principal component analysis which rests on Eigen vectors and Eigen values. So, this uh, is the essential idea behind principal component analysis and uh, this uh, forms a very important uh, component in our discussion on uh, latent semantic indexing. There are other methods of uh, multivariate data analysis like factor analysis, discriminant analysis, cluster analysis and so on. We can take a look at them later, but now uh, we discuss a few points on latent semantic indexing, which uh, principal component analysis actually facilitates. In latent semantic indexing, what we have is a word versus document matrix. So, suppose there are d 1, d 2 up to d n documents and there are m words w 1, w 2 up to w m. All right. So, here are words and here are documents. So, we create a large matrix in the form of words and documents. So, a number here 
a number here which is let us say P 2 2. This will indicate the importance of word 2 in document 2. So, this can for example, be represented by the number of times the word 2 appears in document 2. Similarly, the number of times the word m appears in document n. So, p m n is importance of w m in d n. Now, this is a very large matrix uh, with all the documents and their corresponding vocabulary, the words and their appearance in this document. This uh, matrix is also quite sparse. Okay. Many of the entries are uh, 0 in this whole large uh, matrix. And uh, on this, if we apply principal component analysis, we can reduce the size of the matrix. Okay. Only some of the words or some of the documents become important depending on whether the words are looked upon as attributes or the documents are looked upon as attributes. So, once this principal uh, component analysis is done, we find out the important words or important documents and then we can find out the words which are important, okay, the attributes which are important that is words or documents which are important and based on that we can find out association between the words. So, so assume we take two synonymous words book and a very strongly associated word let us say read, okay, book and read. Now, the word book appears in many documents D 1, D 2 up to D n, read also appears in many documents and this matrix will try to capture the strong association between book and read. So, we will go into more details of principal component analysis and latent semantic indexing in the subsequent class and show the strong connection between NLP and IR through this.